this is my first time here, um, and it is, it is a, a very interesting opportunity to speak to you and try to tell the story that uh, we have been working on for the past uh, uh, three to four years. Well, the, uh, the idea behind this talk is to try to link uh, these two uh, uh, characteristics of ayahuasca, the mental imagery and the increased internal attention using uh, what we called functional magnetic resonance imaging. In order to do so, I first uh, like to acknowledge some of our uh, friends and collaborators who have uh, taken part of, of this study. Um, and and, and uh, before I begin in uh, 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 telling you this story, it's important to, uh, so that you know what type of perspective that we have been uh, working to tell this story. So uh, our perspective is, is, as we all know, the uh, ayahuasca experience, it uh, has many different perspectives. Uh, as Bia Labachi mentioned this morning, um, uh, earlier this morning, uh, you have uh, the anthropology, uh, you have the, the uh, 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 I mean, the experience is very much more complex than uh, from uh, the perspective that we have been working on. So our perspective is um, to try to investigate the uh, neural basis of some perceptual and cognitive uh, changes that are induced by ayahuasca. So it is as limited as what I'm telling you. So we're looking at the uh, experience of ayahuasca from this very narrow perspective. And, uh, and, and this perspective is, is narrow also by the tool that we have been using to uh, investigate this neural basis of ayahuasca. So what we, we are trying to do really is to use a very, um, uh, it's what we have as far as neuroscience, but it is a uh, non that specific tool to investigate the brain, and that is to use functional magnetic resonance imaging. So I'm not gonna go into the details on how uh, fMRI works, but uh, all I want you to, to, to understand in order to understand our results is the fact that basically what we need is a, a uh, MRI scanner, and uh, by doing the exam d using this uh, tool, we are capable of constructing images like this ones. So what these images bring is, uh, the information that these images bring is basically this. Uh, whatever you see in yellow mean that um, this area of the brain is responding to whatever task you are having or asking the subject to perform. Whatever you see in blue means that uh, these regions are decreasing its activation when the subject is performing the task. So this is the information that uh, you need to know in order to understand what uh, I've been talking about. Um, so the, the, the experience, the ayahuasca experience have uh, many different uh, aspects. So there are two aspects that uh, we have been uh, focusing on. The first one is uh, the visual images. As we all know, uh, this is a very important aspect of uh, the ayahuasca experience. The second uh, aspect that we have been investigating is the altered perception of self, and this I've been, I will be calling the increase interception or the increase um, uh, idea that you're looking, you're moving in, you're looking at yourself. Um, so in order to do so, basically what we did to look for these two aspects, what I'll be presenting are two studies that we conducted about two years ago uh, to investigate these two perceptual and cognitive changes. Uh, it, to, in these two studies, uh, we did, uh, we, we worked on with uh, 10 experienced uh, ayahuasca users from the Santo Daime Church in Ribeirão Preto. Uh, these uh, subjects, they participated in two sessions, before and after about two, 200 ml of uh, ayahuasca intake. So uh, what we are doing is comparing the results of the subjects before they use ayahuasca and during the use of, uh, uh, of ayahuasca. Uh, 
the first experiment was presented by uh, my friend uh, Siddhartha Ribeiro, who's also part of this uh, work. Uh, and the first experiment involved the uh, mental imagery aspect of, uh, of ayahuasca. Uh, this first experiment, um, uh, we got it published uh, last year in Human Brain Mapping. And I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to go really briefly to um, have you understanding what are the, uh, the main results that we got from this study. So as I said, what we did was uh, we had an, a 1.5 MRI scanner. Uh, the subject went into the scanner for the first time before the ayahuasca intake. And when they were in the scanner, they had to go through basically three tasks. The first task was a visual perception task. And that is, they would have to passively observe pictures like this one. This is just uh, uh, one of the pictures that they have seen um, of, of a collection of uh, about seven pictures. So they, they just uh, passively viewed the scenes. And then um, the second task that they need to go through was to close their eyes and mentally imagine uh, the, the pictures that they have just seen. We were not really interested in having the subject um, fixing these images in, in, their, in their minds. The instruction that they, they got was, um, if you see something that's more vivid than the image that you just saw, that's not a problem. Just uh, attain your attention to whatever is more vivid. So um, during this period, what we were looking for was to try to mimic, uh, very artificially mimic, what the brain were, was to be doing during the ayahuasca visions. And then the third period, they would just open their eyes again and look at the scrambled versions of these images, in the sense that in this third task, uh, the image would not make a cognitive sense, for to say. Uh, so they did that in, in two different sessions, as I already said. Um, they did that before ayahuasca, uh, and then they uh, got out of the scanner. Uh, they drank about 200 ml of ayahuasca, and then they, uh, 40 minutes after they, they intake the, uh, the 200 ml of ayahuasca, they would go into the scanner again, and then they would perform the same task. So uh, the, the basic comparison that we wanted to make was what are the differences or which brain areas and how these brain areas were, were different in these two periods, before ayahuasca intake, after ayahuasca intake, for these, basically for these two tasks. So how would ayahuasca modulate uh, the brain activation when the subject is perceiving a real image and when the subject is imagining a real image. Uh, so the uh, results that we have, I want you to focus on these uh, yellow areas. What these yellow areas uh, uh, mean is uh, the, are, they, they are showing you the brain areas that were modulated by ayahuasca during the mental imagery task. And that means that uh, these areas were had an increased activation after ayahuasca and during the task, and during the mental imagery task. Uh, what you see here is a pool of uh, different uh, brain areas, but basically we can interpret these results in three main centers. The first center is these centers that are more on the back of the brain called the occipital pole. Um, so these area here, these areas that you see in yellow, they are part of our visual system. And particularly of interest for our study is the fact that uh, this area here, what we call Broadman area 17, which is the primary visual area, it is modulated by um, ayahuasca during the vision. Uh, during the uh, mental imagery. Uh, so you have visual centers being engaged in this mental imagery during the ayahuasca. You have uh, temporal, medial temporal. So these areas here, they are really in, uh, basically in the center of the brain. Uh, these temporal areas, they have a very important uh, aspect on memory. 
Uh, and these frontal areas here that you see down here, they are um, uh, very important in, in, in processes of uh, intention. Um, so we have basically, we, 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 tr we um, can try to understand these results saying that basically that uh, the uh, brain centers that are modulated by ayahuasca during the mental imagery tasks are related to vision, to memory, and to intention. Um, in, uh, the second aspect which I find very interesting from this study, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all these graphs, but uh, there, there is one aspect that I want to catch your attention to. And this is, um, in blue, you see uh, the, uh, the signal from different areas uh, before, during the visual imagery task before uh, ayahuasca intake. In red is the visual imagery after ayahuasca intake. In gray, the, during the visual perception task, when they were looking at the, passively looking at the images, before ayahuasca intake, and in green is the visual perception after the uh, ayahuasca intake. So uh, what I want to show you uh, basically is this. If you look at uh, these areas here on top um, that are now in yellow, these are some of the areas from our visual system. So what you're seeing here is, is the following. In blue, you see that you have a very different signal in these two areas when you compare to the other uh, three tasks, meaning that in blue is uh, when the subjects were with their eyes closed, imagining uh, those images. So what you see here is that this is the only time where the signal is different from the other three tasks. Meaning that, uh, so what, what, what I want to catch your attention to is, is this. If you look at the signal, the visual imagery after ayahuasca intake, the signal is about the same as the signal during the perception. So what we conclude from that, what we can um, uh, 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 try to extrapolate our results is to say that uh, the, during the mental imagery task and after ayahuasca intake, the subjects are seeing something. What we are saying is that uh, when they are not with the ayahuasca, we have what we are expecting, and that is the visual system is not being stimulated. We, the subjects are with their eyes closed. So um, the signal of the visual system, when the subjects are with their eyes closed without ayahuasca, is what we expect is different from when they're perceiving a image with their eyes open. But when you look at the signal, when the subjects are with their eyes closed, but now under the effect of ayahuasca, then you have a signal that is compared to the perception itself. And that happened in the visual areas, in the main uh, 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 temporal areas that I said that are related to memory, and that uh, also related to uh, the frontal areas that are related to, say, to intention. So the uh, broad and main conclusions that we got from this set, of, um, from this first set of, of, of data, from this first experiment, is that uh, the, during the visions, uh, ayahuasca modulate, during the, the uh, mental imagery task, the ayahuasca modulates centers that are involved in vision, memory, and intention. Uh, the, the second conclusion comes from the, the last slide, and that is that the modulation that ayahuasca produces make the signal from this structure indistinguishable from the signal that it has during perception, meaning that, uh, so the interpretation, the extrapolation that we can do from these results is that the subjects are really um, uh, modulating that system that is responsible for the visual perception. So the third uh, uh, extrapol extrapolation that we can make from these results is the following, uh, that this may be the uh, possible neural mechanism underlying the fact that uh, ayahuasca has been used for a long time, and that might be uh, uh, the, the reason uh, that ayahuasca is being used as a vehicle to help the investigation of your own memory. 
So you have the visual system, you have uh, the memory system, and you have an intention system. Um, so the extrapolation, uh, and this is something that we are, we are after now, is um, to try to, under to better understand if uh, this is uh, uh, the mechanism that ayahuasca has to bring your own light to your own memories. Uh, the human, humans are basically visual uh, individuals. So that, and the second extrapolation would be that uh, that confers the status of true to something. Independently of this extrapolation, the fact is this interpretation uh, has something very interesting, and that is that ayahuasca makes a move in process. It makes a process that, as we all know, that it makes a process to look to the inside. So it helps you look into the inside. It induces you to look to the inside. So that motivates somehow our second set of experiments, and that is how the ayahuasca modulates these systems that are part of the systems that are now being thought of as uh, important for this moving in uh, process. And in order to explain the results, I have to tell you a little bit about these uh, default mode network that Amanda Fielding um, talked to us uh, uh, briefly this morning. Uh, so uh, the default mode network is, is, is basically this. When, when, you, when you do an fMRI study, like the one I've just shown, and many of the different studies that you have in the literature, basically what you're looking at is the following. What are the brain structures that respond to a specific stimulus? If I, if I squeeze my hand, my brain is sending signals so that I can squeeze my hand. So which are the centers that respond to this task, squeezing your hand? So I, I'd say that 80% of the fMRI literature is based on this, uh, on, on this paradigm. And that is, if you have a task, what are the brain areas that respond to these tasks and how they respond to this task? So you have a whole bunch of maps like this one. So these come from different studies. And then you have these maps that says, well, these area responded to this task, and, and the other areas did not respond to this task. So uh, a couple of years ago, a second um, uh, question or, 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 or uh, type of questions, they emerged. And that is, what is the brain doing when you're at rest, when you're not doing anything? Um, so when I'm squeezing my hand, I know which areas are, are being uh, 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 activated to have that uh, moving going on. But when I'm not doing anything, when I'm relaxed and when I'm not doing anything, what is the brain doing? So uh, what people have found is that there is a very consistent network, and that is there is a very consistent set of brain areas that, and these lists here, so you have areas uh, and the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. So th there is this very consistent network. What I, what I, what I want to uh, catch your attention again is the fact that it is very consistent. So it happens independent of the person. It happens independent on the task. It happens. It is a very consistent set of network, uh, set of brain structures. And what do these brain structures have in common? So basically uh, what we have from the DMN, so we call these brain uh, regions the default mode network. Uh, so what do they have in common? Basically, uh, these regions, they show a greater signal when you're not doing anything. So it is as a, an idling of a car, uh, an, an, uh, of an, an idling rhythm. When you're not doing anything, the brain is, is working as an organized system. For, uh, for us all, this is the interpretation of the, mental lim the, the default mode network. And the second thing that's interesting about the default mode network is that this signal, so the, it, there is an increased activation on these areas, on these set of areas when you're not doing anything. But when you start doing something, the signal of these areas diminishes. So you have a decrease in the signals of these areas when you're doing something. So um, with these results, it's a very interesting set of results because now you have, um, there are many interpretations for it. why do we need a default mode network? What is the default mode network? And these interpretations, they spun from um, underlying the autobiographical uh, memory system, 
the future planning, uh, social cognition, spontaneous mental activity, self-referential uh, mental activity, mind-wandering, daydreaming, and that is what is that you're doing when you're at rest? Because, see, if you're at rest and you have a very consistent brain network that responds when you're at rest, the interpretation of these results is that there might be something that is going on for everyone when you're at rest. Okay. So, um, independently, so the, uh, and what is it that you're basically doing? You're mind wandering, you're daydreaming. Uh, so, the interpretation of this high signal, uh, probably many of you right now are daydreaming. <laughs> you're looking at me, but you, you, you're daydreaming on something else. Uh, and part of this daydreaming system is not conscious. So, and, and, and this is very common for every one of us. We are here, and then all of a sudden we are like, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm out of here and I didn't know. I, I, I thought I was paying attention to whatever, but I was not. I'm thinking about uh, something that I have to pay or whatever, right? So uh, this, this have, this, the, the, the full mode network, uh, because of this interpretations, they have been uh, calling a lot of the attention of the neuroscientific community. Uh, independent on the uh, interpretation of the default mode network, it, it seems to be a marker of increased internal attention. Um, so if you have a really, uh, if you were paying attention to the inside, then you'd have a modulation of this default, no, net, default mode network signal. Uh, the classical interpretation of the default mode network is the one I just gave you, is the fact that, uh, um, and this, this is a very uh, uh, important paper that was published in Science in 2007, and what they show is that uh, there is a correlation between the signal on the default mode network and the mind wandering. So the more you mind wander, the, the greater the signal in the default mode network. Right? So this is the basic idea uh, that, uh, this is the classical interpretation of the default mode network. Daydream, uh, if you're daydreaming, then you have an increased DMN, uh, signal on the DMN. If you're decreasing the daydreaming, then you have a decreased signal on the DMN. All right, so what we did um, then as a second experiment was to try to understand how the ayahuasca modulates the DMN. How, how, how is the signal change in the, in the default mode network by ayahuasca? So it was, uh, 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 the task is not really uh, relevant right now, but uh, what we did was we have the subjects doing something and we looked at the periods when the subjects was not doing anything, right? So we were looking at the DMN when the subjects were not performing a task, okay? So uh, these are the, uh, the, 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 the main results we have. So basically what we have is, is this. The result on the DMN diminishes after ayahuasca intake. Um, so what are the possible interpretations for this result? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the last slide. Uh, what's interesting is that, uh, can you center a little bit, uh, is it, well, never mind, it's fine. Um, so, uh, there are uh, results that are consistent with the type of results that we have been obtaining. And where are these results? Mainly, uh, I want to show you two examples. There are many results uh, that have been related to uh, pathologies, to different uh, diseases, to uh, different status, to whatever. But um, uh, it, it is first very consistent to find a decrease signal on the DMN, the same thing that we found in uh, experienced meditators. So if you look at experienced meditators, so these are two examples of, uh, of uh, 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 experienced meditators, you have a decrease signal on the DMN. So what is the main interpretation of these set of results? Uh, when uh, uh, you are studying experienced meditators, what you have is a decrease on the daydreaming. That is, the, if you look at these papers like this, 
The first paper, this appears in the abstract. So the interpretation is that the reduction on the DMN means a reduction in the daydreaming. All right? The second uh, experiment, uh, David Nutt's group have a, a set of three experiments looking at the DMN, um, and they have very consistent uh, results. It's a really well-designed experiment um, with uh, psilocybin. And they found something that uh, it's, it's uh, the same thing that we did. Uh, that is a decrease signal on the DMN after psilocybin. Um, what goes on the opposite direction? So I just want to show you one example of something that goes in the opposite direction, and that is a depression. So what happens in the DMN with depression? So people have been working with uh, 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 patients with depression and have been finding that uh, there is actually an increase in the DMN after, uh, in, in these subjects, right? How is this result here being interpreted? Is the fact that uh, 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 patients with depression, they have increased rumination. So what is a rumination? Rumination is, are those thoughts, those um, uh, 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 bad thoughts, first to say, um, or negative thoughts that uh, patients with depression cannot get rid of. So that really um, makes sense if you have this interpretation that you have an increased daydreaming, uh, but daydreaming with a negative uh, content. So you have an increased daydreaming of negative content, then you have an increased signal on the DMN. All right? So this is the opposite that we have been finding. So basically, these uh, two, uh, the second experiment uh, shows us first that uh, ayahuasca reduces the signal of the DMN. And that is consistent with uh, psilocybin and consistent with the studies with uh, experienced meditators uh, that also found a decreased signal on the DMN. Uh, so what are the possible explanations for this? Uh, the first straight explanation for this set of results is what people have been interpreting the DMN, and that is uh, you would have a decrease mind wandering. But then uh, there is a question. Uh, does that make sense with the ayahuasca experience? Do you think that you have a decreased mind wandering when you're under the effect of ayahuasca? I may or may not, I don't know. Second interpretation is that uh, during ayahuasca, actually the subjects are engaged on a task. So if they're engaged on a task, it means that then you'd have a natural decrease on the signal of the DMN. The third interpretation, that's the one I like the most, uh, is the following. Actually, uh, what we are seeing is in meditators, as well as in the ayahuasca experience, is a detaching attitude. And what do I mean by detaching? When you're doing a, uh, when you're doing a meditation, like a vipassana meditation practice, what you have to do is to pay attention to your daydreaming. That's the instruction. But do not attach to that experience. That's the instruction. With the ayahuasca, our inter or at least my interpretation is the following. You are not under control anymore. <laughs> uh, so you are not attaching to that experience. That is some, is it true? I don't know. This is just an interpretation of our results. Um, so, and the last thing is that that makes sense to the uh, depression results. What would you, we have in the depression results? We have an increased signal in the DMN. So an increased attachment to something. 
an increased attachment to the daydreaming, to the content of the daydreaming. Uh, independent on uh, what is the interpretation, I want to move to the third step, and that is uh, the, fo the future perspective of our group. Uh, there are some perspectives of uh, understanding the uh, neurobiology from the neuroscientist uh, perspective, some of the neuromechanisms that are behind these perceptual and cognitive effects uh, of ayahuasca. But then uh, these uh, results and, and, and different set of results that I'll show you moved us to uh, open a new line of research. Uh, so the future uh, perspective, uh, one of the future perspectives that we have based on, uh, uh, in part, on what I just told you. And that was exactly what uh, Amanda Fielding um, told you guys this morning. That is, we have a biological marker, a brain marker, saying that ayahuasca or psilocybin move the DMN in the opposite direction that the depression moved the DMN. So that's uh, uh, exciting. Um, Besides this, uh, if you, there is a second very important marker, uh, and that is if you look uh, at uh, polysomnography data, and what is polysomnography? It's uh, a sleep EEG. Um, so if you have a sleep problem, you're probably going to be having to do a polysomnography, and that is a EEG when you're, when you're sleeping, right? There are different markers that you bring from this, uh, uh, from this examination. One of them is the REM duration, or REM sleep. REM sleep is a phase of the sleep, is a phase where you, you dream. So what you see in uh, what is very consistent and probably the most consistent marker on the literature of depression is the fact that when you do a polysomnography in patients with depression, you have an increased REM duration. You have an increased uh, period of your sleep when uh, that you are in this REM uh, sleep. You have a reduction on REM latency, and that is REM starts earlier in depression. And you have a reduction in another phase of, of sleep, and that doesn't matter. So why is, that, why is this important? First, because this is the main marker, biological marker of depression. If, if there is something, really? <laughs> All right. <laughs> If you have a, um, a uh, what was I saying? <laughs> Thank you. If you have a biological marker of depression, uh, that is the biological marker that we have. Um, and Reba's, uh, Jordi's group, have shown a very interesting study showing that uh, ayahuasca moves, apparently, uh, the polysomnography uh, data on the opposite direction. So, so that is the second um, interesting marker saying that the ayahuasca moves this biological marker. The DMN was the first and now the polysonography uh, as a reduction, for instance, in the REM duration. They did not really find an increased REM late that seem as there is a, a trend in increase, right, Jordi? Okay. Um, so this is uh, basically uh, the second marker that we have. And this third exciting uh, 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 marker that we have comes from a pilot study that we have been conducting in Ribeirão Preto. So we already have uh, 17 patients uh, going, uh, patients with depression going in a single ayahuasca evaluation. So uh, this is a group of, of people. This, this pilot study has been coordinated by Professor Jaime Halak from the uh, University of Sao Paulo in Ribeirão Preto and has uh, the participation of Jorge of our group in Natal. Um, so basically uh, what I'll show you is the preliminary results of this data. This, th th this data is not from the 17 patients, it's from nine of these 17 patients. Um, so what you have here, what I want to uh, um, show you are these two lines here, the purple and the uh, uh, blue, dark blue line. Uh, these are uh, depression scales, psychiatry evaluation for two scales, uh, the Hamilton scale and the Montgomery Asberg uh, scale. Uh, 
what you see and here is time. So these patients, uh, they have taken a single dose of ayahuasca and then you evaluate these patients uh, 10 minutes before intake, 40 minutes after, 80 minutes after, 140, 180, and then one day, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. So uh, this is a, 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 a very uh, um, exciting result because what you see here is a, a definite decrease, at least on the scales, of, uh, uh, of depression signs uh, already in the first day. So there are two things that uh, are really important in these results. If you look at the, the uh, main drugs for depression, uh, first thing is that uh, you, you, most of the times, you will need 14 days of using the drug before it gets to any results, if so. And here, what you have is something that already is apparently working on day one. The second interesting result here is that this is a single dose. So a single dose here is apparently lasting for um, at least seven days. This is consistent. The 14 and the 21 days is something that's under investigation. Um, so at least seven days after a single dose, it apparently has uh, still uh, have a result. So that uh, made us uh, go, all right, all right, all right, yep. Uh, so just that I don't forget. Um, all right, so there is a, a that, that um, uh, made us go to the second phase of the study, which will start in, in September this year. Um, so what is the, single, uh, the, the second phase? The first thing of, a second, of this second phase is that uh, we'll, we'll have to go to what we, ki what we call a uh, double-blind, randomized, placebo study. And that means that uh, we'll have to have ayahuasca um, uh, in, in, as a powder, as a capsule. Um, the, the subjects, and we'll have uh, 40 uh, uh, subjects, uh, individuals with depression. 20 of these uh, individuals, they will go to uh, a placebo, and 20 will go to the uh, ayahuasca session. Uh, the 20 control individuals, uh, what, what is it? Well, the control individuals are individuals not uh, diagnosed with, uh, uh, with uh, depression. Uh, these 20 individuals, they will, will participate twice in the exam, and, and that is randomized. So the first time they get in the, the hospital, they will go either to the placebo or to uh, the experimental session. And the second time, they go to the other one. Uh, uh, the, the second uh, different aspect of this study is that we'll use uh, many different biological markers. We will use uh, MRI and fMRI that I just showed you. We use a polysonography. We use uh, neuropsychological and psychiatry scales. We use uh, two different evaluations of EEG, and we uh, will inspect a blood and saliva. Uh, uh, the, the design of this study, this is basically what we're going to be starting in, 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 in September. Um, so that would be conducted in the, uh, ho in the university hospital since the patients will have to be uh, in the hospital for uh, eight days. So on day one, on the admission, so day one they will just be admitted. And day four, they would go through the whole uh, battery of, of examinations. Uh, day five, they would go through the experimental session. Day seven, they will go to the second examination, and day eight, they will leave the hospital. Um, so, uh, and, and as I said, we would go for um, a, 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 uh, a different uh, way of administration of, of the ayahuasca component. Um, this uh, would uh, go with a lot more help from different people, so the group have um, uh, new members added for the second phase, uh, people from the uh, psychiatry, people from the physiology, people from the biophysics, people from the pharmacology, people from the psychology, and Georgi Hiba that uh, you all know, uh, and, and possibly uh, Stephen Baker, uh, who's going to probably take part of the study. Um, this study is already, um, we just got the financial support uh, to conduct this study. We already got the uh, uh, the approval from the ethic committee 
uh, from our uh, hospital. So it's ready to go. It's just a matter of having the MRI scanner installed, uh, which will hopefully be in about uh, two weeks. So, um, and, and I hope to have uh, good news in a near uh, future. So once more, I have to thank, thank Bia uh, for uh, bringing uh, Bentinho. Uh, and, and, and to all of you for listening uh, and daydreaming. Thank you.